It's spring in New England. The flowers are blooming, the trees are growing, the birds are singing, and it's time to garden. I'm Charlie Nardozzi, and welcome to New England Gardening Spring Edition 2021. We're gonna be talking all about different types of gardens that you can grow in your yard. We'll be talking about vegetable gardens, for example, some easy raised beds that you can grow without having to dig the soil. I'll also talk about pruning hydrangeas and propagating rhododendrons. And I'll be joined by some friends, too. They're gonna to help us understand more about pollinator gardens and how to attract bees and butterflies to our yard, how to grow railing planters and hanging baskets in small spaces, and how to garden with kids. So come join me at this exciting time of year when we learn about gardening and how to make our yards more beautiful and productive. Container gardening is hot. More and more people are growing containers on decks, patios, and balconies to grow beautiful flowers, herbs, and vegetables. But what happens if you have a deck or a patio or a small balcony and you don't have a lot of space? Maybe you want to have some lawn furniture out there, um, a fire pit, or maybe even a grill. How are you going to have your plants and all of those things too? I've got a solution for you. Hanging baskets, railing planters, and window boxes are a way to grow vertical. It gets everything off the ground so you can have all kinds of things going on on the deck and patio, but still be able to grow beautiful flowers, herbs, and vegetables. I'm here at Winterberry Gardens in Southington, Connecticut, and we're gonna show you how to put together some beautiful containers. First, you have to have the right container for vertical gardening, and there's so many different options now. For example, you can get something like a hanging basket. Everyone is familiar with those. Those will hang down and you can grow all kinds of flowers, fruits, and veggies in them. These hanging baskets also are great because a lot of them now have a material called coir in them, C-O-I-R. This is a coconut husk fiber that's a byproduct of the coconut industry. And what they found is it makes a great liner for hanging baskets and a great additive for seed starting mixes too. So having the coir in there will help the plants breathe a little bit, the roots will breathe, and yet it holds enough moisture so they grow really well. Now, if you're looking to get things off the ground and uh, in, onto your railings, there's lots of different options. If you have a metal railing, you can have one of these planters and you can see that it has this little saddle on it that just goes right over the metal railing and it just sits there. And then you can just fill it with your favorite flowers. Another option would be one if you have a two by four or a two by six. You can see that this one has two different diameter openings here and you can just lay it on top of your deck or railing. And what happens is that it's so heavy with all the soil and flowers in it, it won't blow over, the raccoons won't knock it over, the squirrels won't knock it over. Both of these come in what we call self-watering containers, and this is really an important feature. That's where you fill up a reservoir in the bottom, and it's filled up with all kinds of moisture that's going to seep into the soil, and then keep your container nice and moist for days. So you can go away to the beach and not have to worry about them drying out. Now, if you do have a little space on the ground but not a lot of storage space, these are really good. These are called grow bags, and they're made out of this fleece material that is perfect for uh, any kind of flower or vegetable in it because it breathes a little bit, yet holds a lot of moisture. The best part about this is that when you're done in the fall, you just compost the potting soil. You can just fold it back up again and then just stick it in the bottom of a closet, and that's your container garden right there. So you see that there's lots of different container options that you can have that'll work really well in your garden. And of course, potting soil would be the next thing you want to put in there. And I mentioned coir. And if you take a look at this coir material here, this is moistened coir. And you can see that it's pretty light and fluffy. That's even when it's moist. That's the nice thing about this. It doesn't get really soggy like a peat moss will. So when you're looking for potting soils, look for one that has some coir in it. That could be a nice thing, as well as one that has some organic materials like a little bit of compost. That's good too. So once you've got your containers and your potting soil, then you got a plant. And that's when I'm gonna bring in a local expert. Here at Winterberry Gardens, there's a head grower named Sebi Milano, and I'm gonna ask him to help me out. Sebi, hey, how are you? I'm doing great, how about you? I'm doing really well. Good. So That's... Sebi, uh, you've been here a little while, right? 18 years. 18 years. Into my second career. Oh, nice. So yeah. what was the big change? Why did you decide to do gardening? Well, I'm Italian. <laughs> so that, so I couldn't Need tell. I say more? <laughs> and uh, I, I can't ever remember not having a vegetable garden in my backyard. And mm -hmm. 
what's better than this? You know, in uh, January when you're shoveling snow, I'm in my T-shirt in my greenhouse and enjoying the day. Right, and you're growing figs too. I saw those. You, you, and they better be there when you leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Sebi, I'm sure a lot of people come in and ask you questions about uh, putting together a container, right. uh, whether it be a window box or a railing planter. Yep. And so a lot of times people just don't know where to start. So what kind of tips would you give them? Well, when they pick out plants for their containers, they should be plants that are appealing to them. You're going to be looking at it for a longer period of time than anyone <laughs> else. So pick something that you like. Number two, be conscious of the size of the plants that are going in, because mm -hmm. if you have a container like this and the plants are gonna get like that, it's not gonna work out too well. Mm -hmm. The other thing, some plants like sun, some plants like right. shade, try to put all shade plants in one, all sun plants in the other, if they're getting that uh, type of exposure. Mm -hmm. And uh, pay attention to the, to the tags. You know, the tags will tell you if uh, they need to have a lot of water, a little bit of water. So. Mm -hmm. All those little things play into having a successful uh, container. That's yeah, great. So those are all good tips. And I think probably the best way to learn is to show people. And I've got a challenge for you. For me? Yeah, for you. Yeah. All right. You ready for this? Sure. Okay. I'm going to give you 10 minutes. Yeah. And we're both going to go into the greenhouses. Mm -hmm. You pick out some plants for a sun-loving container. I'm going to okay. pick out some plants for a shade-loving container. We're going to see who does a better job. Yeah, let's go. I'm okay. <laughs> Gotta go with latte. I'm Italian. Latte. Going over the edge. Yep, Charlie's going down. No way is he gonna beat me. No way. Gorgeous. This is a winning basket. So you got some uh, kind of okay plants there, Sebi. Better than uh, what's on that side, oh, but that's sorry. This is much better for a shade. But let's put it all together and see what it looks like, right? You got it. All right. All right. You know, I love this new fuchsia you got here. This one's a really pretty one because it has some nice variegation on the leaves. I knew if you liked that one, I would have probably hit it on you. <laughs> and of course, in the shade, you can't go wrong with a good coleus, right? Well, that's, that's a good pick. One of the things people do a lot, you know, they overpack their containers. Right. They put too many plants in, so you got to leave a little room for things to grow. So tell me what you did here, Sebi. Well, we got a nice little uh, magenta dracaena in here. Mm -hmm. A little Swedish ivy to give us a little tumble effect off the rail. Uh -huh. Some uh, bl uh, blue velvet uh, petunias, latte. Yeah. And uh, everything's looking uh, pretty nice. Yeah, nice primary colors. Yeah. You got your purples and your yellows. Yeah. You got a little red to take the highlight from yeah. this nice dracaena. Yeah. So obviously the winner. Well, this is good for sun, but look at what you can do for shade without a flower. Do you notice there's no flowers here? Well, there's going to be some little flowers. There'll be some little flowers. But the beautiful coleus there, you can see this nice fuchsia has a little kind of pink in it, which picks up the color from the coleus. And we got the Lysimachia in the front with a sweet potato vine to, to pick up some of the dark color. This is a stunning container. Good choices all around, mm -hmm. beautiful container. Second place, so uh, without a no. doubt. I, I think I think I've definitely got you beat. <laughs> oh, hold. How are we gonna do this? Wait a minute. How are we gonna settle this? Ashley, you got a minute? Yeah, I'll be right there. We're we're having a discussion here. Charlie obviously did this one. I did this one, and maybe you could oh, like the, the judge. Can you judge this for right. us, please? The judge. Okay, you both have your thriller, your spiller, yep, and your filler. So let's see. Based off of the two. Mm. They're both really nice. One sun, one shade. In all fairness, I'd say both of you, both of you are the winners. They are oh, a very close, nice very she, close huh? tie. Good job, Sandy. Very close. You did a great job. <laughs> but really, if you guys want competition next time, mm -hmm. just call me. <laughs> Beat it. <laughs> See you Thanks, later, Ashley. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Sebi, for coming. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. You did a good job, too. Hey, thanks. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, good luck thanks. at your garden set. Thanks. Take care. Everyone seems to be talking about bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds, and pollinators. Pollinator gardens are showing up everywhere, in schools, in home gardens. There's even a pollinator pathway system in Connecticut and New York where people are growing pollinator gardens in public spaces. So what's all this hubbub about pollinators? Well, pollinators are essential. A third of the food that we eat is due to pollinators. 
Plus, pollinators, of course, spread pollen between flowers, and that helps with biodiversity, creating new plants all the time. Now, pollinators need more than just flowers. There are other things that they need, such as water. It could be a bird bath, it could be a little pond, it could even be a little mud puddle that you put together. These are really cute. All you need is a drainage pan, put some gravel in it, a little clay soil and compost, put a little water in it, and you'll see the butterflies and bees will flock to it during a really hot day. The other thing pollinators need is a nesting spot. Now, we all know about beehives or honeybees, which are a very social insect, but not all pollinators are social. There are many solitary bees, flies, wasps that are pollinators. One of the best ones is the mason bee. Let me show you a house. This is the mason bee house. Now, this is a great thing because mason bees are excellent pollinators. They're 100 times more efficient than honeybees and bumblebees at pollinating flowers. And you only need two or three of them to pollinate a whole apple tree. They don't sting, and they overwinter really easily. You can hang one of these in your garden. You get mason bees moving in and taking care of all your pollination needs. So let's take a look at all the flowers that you can now grow to attract all these different types of pollinators. We're here with Pat Sabasic, Master Gardener at the Hillstead Museum and Gardens in Farmington, Connecticut. Pat is the head of this new pollinator garden that they just installed here. Pat, can you uh, tell us a little bit about this garden and the history of it? Sure. So the garden is on the former greenhouse that served the estate in the 1800s and the early 1900s. And the Master Gardeners reclaimed the area and designed a garden to be used as a teaching garden for master gardeners and also to educate the public on what a pollinator garden is. Nice, so you know, many people watching this may want to install a pollinator garden or at least have some pollinator plants in their garden. So what kind of tips would you give them? So plant in the sun, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's always important. Although there are some lovely shade blooming uh, flowers early in the spring. Um, have a diversity of shapes and a diversity of colors. It's also important not to use pesticides. We don't use anything here in either of the gardens in the, on the Hillstead estate, mm -hmm. just to keep things uh, safe for all the different types of pollinators and birds that are in our gardens. You don't have to have a whole garden, too. You can just put in a couple plants and try to use native plants whenever you can. Native plants are important. You know, if you wanted to start small, 10 different plants will do it. Things that are not too far off of center, so uh, some, <laughs> yes. of, some of the weird colors that we see in echinacea, because they're mm -hmm. easy to breed, um, is, is not good. I mean, they're beautiful uh -huh. and they're different, but the farther you get away from your native plant, the less nutritious the nectar and the pollen is. Exactly. And so that's the important part. And plant them in clumps so the, yes. the butterflies and bees can find them exactly. easily. Exactly. Um, and of course, you know, have a water source nearby, keep it away from kids and things with, or animals that might be running and, around. And noise, that's right. And noise too. That's right. That's nice. Right. Yes. Well, we got some basic ideas on during a pollinator garden. Let's take a look at some specific plants. I think that's a great idea. Pat, we have a beautiful array of annual and perennial flowers here that would be great for a pollinator garden. And when you're putting these flowers in and you're selecting them at a nursery, you have to really look at not just the colors, but the flower shapes themselves. That's right. Yeah. That's important. So, for example, we have uh, this daisy type flower here, mm -hmm. and this is, um, this is uh, it's a beautiful shape, radial symmetry. It's easy for insects to identify and uh, a nice little landing pad for them to, to drop on take some pollen, maybe take some nectar. This um, woodland phlox also has a bit of a landing pad on it, but uh -huh. it has a tubular shape. And so the, all the nectar and the pollen is sort of down in the throat of the flower. So we'll take a different insect to pollinate that. This comes in the spring. Mm -hmm. And then later on, in terms of tubular shapes, we have the salvia. It's a different type of a pollinator who has a little bit more of a longer nose to go inside the flower to get the pollen in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And some other nice landing pad type flowers is this beautiful yarrow we have here. And there's a number of other plants that are like that in our gardens. You know, dill when it goes to seed, That's for right. example, and Queen Anne's lace. Yes, yeah. yeah. As a wildflower. That's right. 
And of course, fragrance is something that's really fun. You know, this is alyssum, of course, and it has, ah, I love the fragrance of this, uh, a beautiful fragrance to it. And of course, it's an annual, it flowers all season long. But pollinators like that, uh, as well as herbs like this lavender and, and borage right. and mints, um, anything that has a fragrance, pollinators are, are attracted that's, to. That's right. And we have a, a version of a mountain mint here mm -hmm. in the garden. That's a late season flower. The leaves, if you crush them, you can smell the mint on them. Um, spreads fast but it also is very, very attractive to late season pollinators, right. both the pollen and the nectar. Nice. So we have some great examples of plants here that we can mm -hmm. use in the garden. And once we have everything planted and growing well, then we got to take care of it. We do, we do. <laughs> so we do have to fertilize yeah. but, uh, during the summer, but not into the fall. Mm -hmm. But in the fall, we have two methods of we call putting the gardens to bed. Yeah. So the sunken garden, the formal garden, we take everything down to the ground. And then we also plant some bulbs there. And then in the pollinator garden, we take off some of the flower heads, but we leave all the seed heads and we leave the grasses. It's a little bit of a winter interest if you're here in the winter, <laughs> um, but it's uh, beneficial more so than we thought in the past. And so we leave that all up. And in the spring is when we actually clean up the garden, but not right away. Mm -hmm. Usually when it's 50 degrees or more okay. for at least a week and then moving into 60 degrees. So we just cleaned up the pollinator garden uh, in the first week of May. Yeah. yeah, so this is a very different aesthetic. It you is. Know, we're so used to just cleaning everything up in the fall, having it look pristine and then starting fresh in the spring. That's but right. the reason we do this is for the ecosystem that we're creating. That's correct. That's mm -hmm. correct for both the insects and the birds. It's nice. very important for them. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Pat. It's been uh, great to have you here and thank great you, to have you show us this beautiful pollinator garden. And hopefully, Pat has given you some great ideas on how to grow pollinator plants in your yard. Spring flowering shrubs in New England are amazing. Ah, oh, I love the smell of lilacs. But one of the questions I always get is, when do I prune my shrubs? I'm gonna make it easy for you. If you have a spring flowering shrub that blooms in May or June, such as lilacs, or forsythia, or mock orange, or rhododendron, you prune those after they're done flowering. You have about a six week window to do that. If you have flowering shrubs that bloom a little bit later, like butterfly bush, clethra, and rose of Sharon, those you prune now. And then there's hydrangeas. A lot of people get confused about hydrangeas because some you prune now and some you prune after flowering. I'm gonna talk about the different types of hydrangeas and when to prune them. There are two types of hydrangeas. The type you have will dictate when you wanna prune them. So if you have the smooth leaf like the Annabelle hydrangea or Incredible hydrangea, those have those big white flowers or pink flowers that grow up from the ground and then they flop over. Those you prune in late winter. Just prune them right down to the ground or to a one foot tall stem. Then there are the ones that bloom a little bit later. Those are the panicle hydrangeas. Those grow up to about eight to 10 feet tall, beautiful shrubs or small trees. They'll have those flowers that start from white and go to pink and then burgundy color, just gorgeous. Those you prune now, you wanna prune those in the spring because both the smooth leaf and the panicle, they actually flower on new growth. So when you're pruning them, of course, you're always looking for a dead, diseased, and broken branches. That's one of the things you're gonna kind of keep an eye out for. And some crossing branches. You wanna open it up a little bit so you can get in there and take those out so it opens up the shrub. The more you prune this, the more you're gonna get new growth, and the more new growth you get, the more flowers you're gonna get in the fall. So for this type of hydrangea, you wanna prune them in late winter or early spring. Another group of hydrangeas are the ones that bloom on the old wood. That's the wood that made it through the winter and is sending up shoots and they start blooming usually on the earlier side, uh, sometime in June and July. These would be the mop head or the blue hydrangeas, which actually come in other colors now too, uh, which are very famous, of course. Uh, the oak leaf hydrangea is another one, and the climbing hydrangea, which is a beautiful climbing uh, plant that vines up the sides of buildings or over rock walls. It's a gorgeous plant with nice white flowers to it. Now the time to prune any of these types of hydrangeas is after they're done flowering in summer. You don't wanna prune them now because you can prune off those flowers. 
and you would just deadhead them and open them up a little bit, take any disease or, or crowding branches off. You don't have to do a lot of pruning on these. But what you can do this time of year, especially on these blue hydrangeas, is prune off any of the old growth that's dead. So you can see these stems here. You can just prune them down to where you see some live growth, where a little growth is coming off the side of that stem. And that's not only gonna clean it up, it's gonna help this live growth grow up and eventually flower for you. Now there is a type of blue hydrangea called the endless summer type. These bloom on that new wood that I was talking about earlier. So any of these shoots that are coming off, off the ground here, they're eventually gonna flower, but in the fall. And they, they bloom off of this old wood that I was just pruning. So those you prune like any blue hydrangea, you prune them after that midsummer flowering. Take them off there, clean it up a little bit. Don't prune the ones coming right out of the ground though. Let those go all the way up. Now, if you've had trouble getting your blue hydrangeas to bloom early, it might be because all of this growth here died right back to the ground. So to prevent that from happening, get some bark mulch in early December or so, just pile it over the top of the shrub and just leave it there till about April. That's gonna insulate those branches so that they can survive so that by this time of year, you'll have all this beautiful growth. And for a fun little trick to propagate new plants from your old shrubs, you can do a little tip layering. This works really well on rhododendrons and wajilas and forsythias too. It's a very simple technique. Let me show you. You're looking for rhododendron growth. It's maybe a year or so old. And what you're gonna do is take a pruner or a knife and just scrape the bark. You just wanna scrape it a little bit here, not all the way through, you're not cutting it. You're just scraping the top bark off. And what that does is expose the cambium layer and then you're gonna take some rooting hormone powder. And rooting hormone powder is a natural material and you're just gonna dust it right on top of there. And that's gonna stimulate new roots starting to grow. Once you have that done, you put it down on the ground, grab a little soil just from underneath the rhododendron and bury it nicely there. Now to ensure that it stays there, one of the things you might wanna do is get a rock or a brick, something heavy that we'll just put right on top of it so that way it'll keep it nice and secure. It'll form roots probably in about six months, but that will be in the fall. So you're probably gonna wanna wait till next spring to actually remove this, cut this off from back here, and you'll have a new plant that you can just dig up with all these roots. With a shrub this size, you can get five or 10 new plants out of it. So it's a great way to propagate a, fav a favorite shrub and have it uh, growing in other places in your landscapes. So whether you're pruning your hydrangeas properly, doing the right pruning at the right time, or propagating your shrubs like rhododendrons, all these things will add a beauty to your landscape and to your yard. Many gardeners are interested in gardening with nature, trying to garden in a way that's gonna be good for all kinds of creatures under the soil and up in the sky. And I've got a great technique for you that's gonna help with that, especially in a vegetable garden. It's called no-dig gardening. Now this is not a new technique, it's one that's been used worldwide for centuries, but it's really having a new revolution coming about as people are discovering it as a great way to mimic what happens in nature and doing it in your vegetable garden. Instead of digging and tilling and turning the soil, we're gonna create layers on top of the soil that are gonna break down, creating very compost-rich soil that'll be perfect for your plants. So there's lots of great advantages for no-dig, and I highlight a lot of these in my book, The Complete Guide to No-Dig Gardening. One of the best ones is that it's good for the soil. Now the soil is an amazing place. In one teaspoon of soil, there are over four billion, with a B, microbes. That means that all these microbes are there working the soil, working with the plants, working with the nutrients, water, and creating a, a nice environment so that the plants will be healthier, stronger, and have less disease and pest problem. Another benefit of no-dig gardening is that it's good for the planet. Every time you till and turn the soil, you're releasing carbon into the atmosphere, which is not good for global warming. By creating layers, you're sequestering the carbon in the soil, in the humus, so it stays there for decades. Also, it's less work, and I really like that part. You're not stripping sod and removing soil. You're just layering on top, so it's less work on your body and easier to do. So there's lots of advantages to no-dig gardening, and I wanna show you how to put one together. Inherent in no-dig gardening is raised beds. It could be freestanding raised beds or a box like this. 
If you're going to use a box like this with wood, you want to get rot resistant wood like cedar or even hemlock and spruce is pretty good too. Also, I love these raised bed corners. These are made out of metal so that even if the wood does eventually rot out, you can just pull it out and put a new board in. So let's layer things. This is also called lasagna gardening. In a name like Nardozzi, I know about lasagna. So what we're gonna do is create layers of different materials. Now, if you have just soil or grass, what you'd wanna do is just mow that grass down really low. And as long as it doesn't have a lot of really tenacious weeds in there, you can just put down three to four layers of newsprint. And you just lay it down uh, right on the bottom here, overlapping. And it's okay if there's color ink on the newsprint because a lot of this is soy based. It's not heavy metals. You do want to avoid glossy paper. That's not good for this. So by putting these layers down, you're gonna block any weeds that are growing in there. You're gonna kill that grass without disturbing the soil at the same time. And earthworms love newspaper. You also want to put a little water on that newspaper, especially on a windy day, because there's nothing worse than putting down the newspaper and then having it blow away when you turn around. Now, if you have an area that has a lot of tenacious weeds, quack grass and, and brambles and things like that, you might want to use cardboard instead of newspaper. Cardboard is really good because it's more durable. It'll last about a year before it totally breaks down. But you do want to use corrugated cardboard. You don't want to use uh, the paper box cardboard like pizza boxes or cereal boxes. Uh, that's not really good material to use. This is nice because it breaks down. You, of course, take all the tape off of it and the staples that it might be on there too. So your next layers, just like in a lasagna, you just put different ingredients on top. So on top of this, I'm gonna put some hay or some straw. And the layers don't really matter as far as how thick they are. It's not really that important with this. This is not like a compost bin where you have to make it a certain thickness and a certain uh, schedule of materials. This, we're just trying to create areas where you're gonna have lots of organic matter there that'll feed those microbes, feed those earthworms, and make it a good spot to break down for your plants. So after we do that, maybe I'll take some fresh grass clippings. This is great to use because it's high in nitrogen. And of course, this is always from an untreated lawn. You don't want to use herbicide treated grass clippings. We'll just sprinkle some of that on top here. Um, another nice organic material to use is chopped leaves. And you want to make sure you run the mower over them a little bit so they break down. Because if they're really big, they might mat down and it'll stop the breakdown process. It'll actually inhibit some of it from breaking down. So we're just gonna throw some leaves on top of that. There we go. And these, you notice, are all materials you'll have just around your yard area. You don't have to really bring in new materials. And then once you have the layers up kind of at the height you want them to, then we're gonna add soil on top of this. And it could be compost, it could be a compost topsoil mix. If you do this bed in the spring, you wanna make it a thick mix, about six inches thick. If you do it in the fall, two or three inches is fine because it'll have all winter to break down. So once you have all the soil in your bed, now the fun part starts. This is when you can plant. And if you're doing this in the spring and you have six inches of soil on top of all that organic matter, you can plant pretty much anything. You might want to avoid root crops because it'll be hard for them to go down really deep, but pretty much anything else will do well in here. So in this case, I could put tomatoes in. Sure, why not? Just dig down. And what I love about this technique is that you don't even need hand tools. You're just use, using the soil there that's nice and light and fluffy and easy to plant. You can put lettuces, of course, around. Um, they will mature earlier and then the space of that tomato will kind of fill in as the plant gets bigger. You could put flowers in, you could put herbs in. All these things will grow really well. And what's also nice is because the soil is so healthy, you're not gonna have to add a lot of fertilizer. Now, as far as maintaining this bed goes, during the growing season, you won't have many weeds because it's all buried underneath with the organic matter. And because there's a lot of organic matter in here, you're not gonna have a lot of problems with the plants drying out and the soil drying out. And then come fall, as the plants start dying back, and if they're healthy plants, uh, you don't necessarily have to dig them out. Remember, we're not digging or tilling or turning the soil. We're trying to avoid that at all costs. So in the fall, what you'd end up doing is if the plants were healthy, you can just chop them down, mulch them up, you know, chop them into little pieces and leave them as a mulch on top of the soil. Because one of the other tenants about no-dig gardening is that you always want to have the soil covered with something, whether it be plants growing or organic material. So you can just leave them there for, like that 
If you have plants that have a lot of disease, maybe like your tomato, you can cut the plant off at the ground, just take it away, get rid of it, and then bring in some hay or straw. So that's gonna be the covering that's gonna protect that plant all through the winter. So with this no-dig gardening technique, you can plant all your favorite vegetables, flowers, and herbs, and then every year just add another layer of organic matter on top, and then compost on top of that, and just plant right through it. And over time, what ends up happening is all those microbes and the earthworms, they break down that organic matter, turning into rich soil that's gonna create healthy plants so you can have a beautiful garden with less work. Kids gardening has become very popular, especially during the pandemic, when lots of families were at home together and they wanted to do activities with their kids. But kids gardening is more than just having them tag along in the garden or making them weed and water and pull things out. Kids gardening really should be something that's gonna really encourage them to love the garden and love being outdoors and being with plants and with nature. And there's some ways that you can do that with your kids. First of all, think of the activities you wanna do with your kids in the garden and make them age appropriate. Meaning if you have a preschooler, you shouldn't expect them to do a lot of gardening for hours out there weeding or designing the garden. Look for moments, look for those teachable moments in the garden where they discover an earthworm or maybe uh, picking a cherry tomato together. Doing things like that will encourage the kids to wanna come back to the garden time and time again. Also, make the garden their own. Allow them to decorate the garden. Allow things to fail. You might be doing a lot more gardening than you normally would in their garden, but the whole idea is to create a place where they're gonna have fun. So there's lots of different techniques to use in a kid's garden, but probably the best way to learn is to talk to someone who's been doing it with their kids. And that's what we're gonna do. I wanna introduce to you Lucy Nepenthanchel. She is from Connecticut Public Radio, and she's the host of Where We Live. She's an avid gardener and she's a mom. And Lucy's gonna come in and we're gonna talk a little bit about how she's been gardening with her kids and how it's been going. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Charlie, good to see you. Usually I'm just talking to you on the radio. That's right, and usually you're interviewing me and now I get to do it. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Oh, you're doing really well. <laughs> so you've been gardening for your, with your kids for a number of years, but it actually started long before that. Uh, you used to garden yourself when you were a little kid. Yeah, my mom was an avid gardener. She was a nurse and so she worked lots of different shifts, but she always made time to work on her garden and she was really into roses. So I remember growing up watching her in the garden and I didn't really do a lot of gardening with her, but once I had my first home, uh, when I moved here uh, in, in Connecticut, it was, it was in Middletown. And when you, you know what it feels like when you have your own space, your own yard. And that's when I really started to explore gardening and do more gardening and a lot of trial and error, as you know. Yeah, of course. Uh, but then it just kind of stuck and I love just gardening. It's, it's a good respite for me, especially uh, working all day, looking at computer screens, doing lots of Zoom meetings. Yep. It's a nice break to be outside. Right, right. And you've transferred that love of garden to your kids, I hope. <laughs> at least you've been trying to. So how has that been going? Have, are there certain things that you've done that have really been successful and other things it's like, oh, that didn't really work out well? Well, something we do every spring when uh, St. Patty's Day comes by, we plant peas. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we do each year. And for us, it's a real sign that spring is coming. Mm -hmm. And I, my children love to come in the garden and eat peas. We've also planted lots of fruit. So raspberry bushes, blueberries, bushes, even some apple trees. And uh, something that's really fun is we have chives that come back year after year and the kids are always munching on those. So it's something that I think that they've gravitated towards because they're helping me plant them and then they mm -hmm. see the outcome of their hard work. Right, exactly. So um, I thought it would be fun to plant a little kid's garden with you and your children. Do you want to do that? Sure, I'd okay. love to. Well, let's go do that. Well, who have we here? So this is our vegetable garden, and these are two of my children, Willow, who's five, and Cormac, who's 10. This is Charlie Nardozzi. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Good. Good. Nice. And you got some beautiful plants there. So did you pick these plants out with your mom? Yep. Yes. Nice. Well, I think we have a nice garden over here. Would you want to help us plant it? Yeah. OK, yes. let's do that. So uh, when we're planting the garden with kids, of course, it's nice to let them kind of take the lead, but you also want to do a little editing <laughs> <laughs> as far as spacing goes and all of that. So what plants are we going to put in first? Let's see. This one. Okay. Do you remember how to take the plant out of the pot, Lilo? 
Here, I'll put my hand here and catch it. How about that? You know what you can do? You can pat the, the bottom there. That's it. Give it a good <laughs> there you go. Yay! There, nice. And so when you plant it, of course, you want to plant it at the, the same depth that it was in its pot. Not too deep, not too shallow. My mom taught me how to. Oh, yeah, your mom? Taught, well, she did a good job. Nice job, Cormac. When I think of planting beds, I think of planting <laughs> similar things. But with yeah. kids, it's nice to have that variety, so they stay interested. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it's their plants. You know, they really take ownership of them. What's your favorite vegetable that you like to plant? Tomatoes. Tomatoes, yeah. Do you like big tomatoes or little tomatoes? Big and small. Uh-huh. And I like sun golds. Whenever I plant them, there's like hundreds of tomatoes that grow, so then I can just keep eating them and I don't have to worry about them running out. Yeah, they love eating chives, the blueberries, the raspberries. I think because we started at a young age, it's just something that they do. We just make it a tradition where we're always outside, working either in our garden beds or just enjoying the plants that we grow throughout the year. All right, I think it's time to do our last little bit. You know what that is? The peas. The peas, right. And you guys were so great to take a little time out in your busy day to help us create a pea trellis made out of twigs and decorate it. So let's bring it over here and stick it in the garden. We're going to put it right on this side where Cormac was. There we go. And then stick it in gently. What do you think? It's looks perfect. It's perfect. Look at that. That's cool. Now we got to plant our peas. And oh, look what I happen to have in my pocket. <laughs> Packets of peas. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much for taking time out to create a garden. So I'm hoping that this grows really well this year for you guys and that uh, you can send me pictures and we can see how beautiful it is and especially pictures of you eating peas. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. We also have cherry tomatoes that would be Oh, and cherry tomatoes. Well, yes, that would be a good thing. <laughs> so take time out during your day and create a little garden with your kids. It doesn't have to be anything special and amazing, but it can be very special for them. Just having a variety of plants, having things that are decorated in that garden, and something that you can do together all summer long.